Hey y'all, I'm Kara Perez, founder of Bravely Go, and you may have heard that three major US banks have collapsed in the last seven, eight days. Right now, there's a lot of fear in the air that this is the beginning of our next great financial crisis, or even really the beginning of the end when it comes to our financial system. With the earlier collapse of FTX and a general sense of financial doom kind of living in a lot of people's minds right now, I wanted to address this and talk about what has happened that's brought us to where we are and what might happen in the future. Now, please know I'm not a bank auditor and I'm not a bank regulator. I'm just a financial educator. So this is still very much so a developing story and things are moving really quickly. So definitely stay tuned to the news and this channel and we'll keep you updated. So you may have seen headlines like these. Silicon Valley Bank is the second largest bank collapse in the entire United States history and it's the biggest bank collapse since 2008. Signature Bank collapsed last Sunday when regulators actually went in and closed it. First Republic Bank has also been in the news a lot as a bank that might be kind of next on the to collapse list, but as of now has not collapsed. So what happened? Why did these banks collapse like this? Banks just generally don't collapse. I feel like I'm saying the word collapse a lot, but that's what happened. It was just kind of like bloop. Banks hold a lot of money, the money that you and I put into it, but also they hold things like investments in securities and they invest into other businesses. Banks make loans, right? Mortgages, car loans, personal loans. Banks are hubs of money coming in and money going out. A huge part of most banks' financial plans is bonds. Bonds have an inverse relationship to interest rates. So when bond yields, when bond returns are high, interest rates tend to be low. But what has been happening for the last year and change? Interest rates have been getting higher. Grandpa Moneybags, AKA Jerome Powell, chair of the Federal Reserve, has been raising interest rates at a steady clip. And that means that bond yields are way lower than they were when these banks first made the investment into these bonds. So banks bought these bonds thinking, hey, this is gonna be a really good investment for us, we're gonna make some money. And now that investment has turned out not so great. So banks are making less money. On top of that, when rumors mostly started by one specific person in Silicon Valley, started to swirl that SVB in particular might go under, people started doing what's known as a bank run. A bank run is when people show up either in person or online to get their cash out of the bank, and banks are required to meet that cash demand. When people do this a lot all at once, like when 50,000 people show up and say, hey, I want my five grand, 10 grand, 100 grand back, a lot of times banks don't necessarily have that liquid in the bank because they've been using it to make these investments and these loans. So in order to get that money, SVB started liquefying, started selling off some of their bonds. But as we just learned, because those bond yields were lower than when they bought in at, these banks were losing money. They weren't able to get back what they had given out. Since they couldn't meet the demand, they collapsed. Now, obviously it's really unsettling to hear that a bank has collapsed, let alone multiple banks, in a very short period of time. Silicon Valley Bank has been getting, I think, the most airtime because they, in particular, were funding a lot of tech startups. Now, tech in particular as an industry has been having a tough last couple of months. There have been tens of thousands of layoffs. A lot of tech companies have announced they are halting certain developments, meaning they are not investing as much into their AI programs. They're not investing into new areas of business. They are trying to save cash. So for the main bank to go under for these tech startups is a huge problem, which leads me to what I think is one of the clearest takeaways of this situation on our hands, which is bank monopolies are bad. SVB backed nearly half of US tech and life science companies. That is nuts and frankly, really irresponsible. Now, I don't think that this is going to translate to a limit on how many tech companies one um, venture backed company or one bank can invest in. That seems like it's very out of line with the American thinking. But I do think that something like this SVB backing half of tech startups in the United States, it might come up in Senate hearings as we begin to kind of tug at the thread of how did we get here? SVB was a big lobbyer for less banking regulation, and I do think that will also come up in the conversation over the next couple of weeks. Should we have less banking regulation or should we have more banking regulation given how quickly these banks collapsed. 
The biggest news that we know for sure so far is that depositors at these banks are being made whole, aka the federal government is giving them back their money. Now, this is really important because a similar thing happened in 2008 or after 2008, which we refer to as a bank bailout. But this is not the same thing. And this is really important, especially if you have any libertarian friends that you might be arguing with about this. The money to make these depositors whole is not coming from taxpayer dollars. It's coming from Wall Street itself in two different ways. For the banks that were put into receivership, the FDIC will use funds from the Deposit Insurance Fund to ensure that all of its depositors are made whole, said a senior Treasury Department official who spoke to reporters Sunday about the plan on the condition of anonymity. This deposit insurance fund is a fund that banks themselves pay into. So it's not coming out of you and I's tax return. The government has also initiated a bank term funding program, which would offer loans for one year to depository institutions. The deposit insurance fund is part of the FDIC and funded by quarterly fees assessed on FDIC insured financial institutions, as well as interest on funds invested in government bonds. So you see, this is not coming from taxpayer funds. Now, another kind of little snag in this is that a lot of the depositors at SVB were not FDIC insured. So to zoom out a little bit, the FDIC is something that we invented after the Great Depression, after the first kind of big round of bank runs in our nation's history. And we said, yo, a lot of people wanted their money back and couldn't get it because of the bank's decisions. And that's not really fair to these people. Let's create this insurance fund that banks will pay into um, that we will use to guarantee up to $250,000 per person per account. So if I have an account at one FDIC insured bank and I have $250,000 in cash in it, the federal government and the FDIC says, hey, Kara, no matter what happens, your bank collapses, there's a bank run, we are guaranteeing you that $250,000 in cash. Now, if I have more than 250K, they're not guaranteeing you know, from 250 to 500,000. They're like, that's up to you, girl. But up to that 250, they're guaranteeing. While SVB was an FDIC insured bank, a lot of the people had more than $250,000 in the bank, which is not insured. But the government has stepped in to say, hey, we are giving you back this money above 250K. We are guaranteeing that you're gonna get this money back. This is somewhat controversial because basically we're setting a precedent to say that we are insuring money even though we are not asking the banks to pay in on this money that we are now guaranteeing is insured. So we're saying, hey, even though the law says we're only supposed to guarantee up until 250, we are actually gonna go ahead and insure all of it. So if you had 300,000 or 500,000 or a million, we're gonna go ahead and guarantee all of that. But the bank wasn't paying in on that extra layer of money. So this is a little bit concerning, I would say. This is making a lot of people a little bit nervous because it's setting a precedent that the government will just kind of like take on a debt that it doesn't necessarily always have the money for. Right now we do have the money. There's a hundred billion dollars in the FDIC insurance fund. We definitely have the money, but looking ahead 100 years, 200 years, if we set this precedent and it becomes how we handle things, we might not always have the money. Finally, one of the other biggest things I'm seeing is how this is impacting other banks. So yesterday, a lot of bank stocks were down overall, even banks not involved in this. I think that we will continue to see that until this kind of comes to a close, bank stocks being um, lower because people are just feeling very nervous around banks right now. But I also think that bigger banks are going to use this as an opportunity to step in and perhaps purchase or gain some control of smaller banks. We're already seeing this begin to happen in the form of loans. Chase in particular has stepped forward and lent a lot of money to First Republic Bank. To zoom out and kind of recap, three major banks have collapsed. Depositors are being made whole, setting an interesting new precedent around insurance protected funds. I think bigger banks are going to use this opportunity to swoop in and kind of have their fingers in institutions smaller than them. And then finally, this may impact bank regulations moving forward. And I think that VC-backed companies are going to have a really tough year. I think this is really going to shake the venture capital world. And obviously the biggest tech bank collapsing is going to ripple out into the tech community. So I think that we can look 
to see more layoffs and more hiring freezes in the tech community for this year. That's it for now, y'all. Stay tuned. Like I said, this is a rapidly developing situation. There will be more updates shortly. So definitely hit subscribe. Make sure to come back and keep reading the news.